Wonderful. All right, I'm just gonna kick it off. All right, welcome everybody to another uh, Getting Ready to Recover, a webinar series put on by DeKalb County Unites. What is DeKalb County Unites? Uh, what it comes down to is this is a grassroots initiative in DeKalb County that involves uh, people from Northern Illinois University, uh, the nonprofit sector, government agencies, uh, the private sector, small businesses, a bunch of us just came together when the COVID-19 crisis hit with the sole mission of how can we drive a positive economic impact on the small business community? And why you ask? Well, we all know a friend, a neighbor, or have a family member that's employed by the small business community. We all know the small business community. They're the ones that support our nonprofits. They're the ones that support our sports teams at our schools, the bands, things like that. That is one of the largest employers within DeKalb County is the small business community and the lifeblood of our economy. So we got together in order to figure out how we can help them uh, uh, survive and, and maybe thrive post COVID-19 um, and limit the amount of impact that this uh, worldwide pandemic has had on DeKalb County. So it's a wonderful group to be a part of and uh, I'm just super excited to have again another webinar and we've got an all-star cast today that is uh, here to answer a lot of questions that you all have had over the last few weeks of of information that has come to DeKalb County Unites. Uh, we've been gathering those subject matter experts in order to get information in the hands of those that need. So DeKalb County Unites, real quick, just go to DeKalbCountyUnites.com. You can see all of our previous webinars and you can see all the scheduled webinars that are up ahead. Every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 p.m. We've got a webinar going and we've got a lot of great subject matter experts. Um, so overall today, uh, I just wanted to say we've got uh, a, a slew of people here from all the right spots. Um, we've got obviously Illinois State Representative uh, Jeff Kiker. Uh, Jeff is a, a, a local boy and an amazing resource for so many of us. And anyone that knows that man knows you're going to get someone that's absolutely genuine and someone's going to work really hard uh, representing you uh, within the 70th district. So Jeff, uh, absolutely thank you for coming on today and welcome. We also have Brad McConnell, he's the CEO of Axion. We've got Margaret Croak and Jonathan, Jennifer, Jonathan McGee from the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity here with us today. And then as well as I said, I'm Colin Barnes with Sundog. This is Courtney Strohacker. Uh, she's with the Cal County Convention and Visitors Bureau. We're the ones that are gonna facilitate the questions, but the star of the show today is gonna be Jock Somizi. He is with the Small Business Development Center and Jock uh, is a wonderful guy that so many of us small business owners have reached out to for help. And that man will pick up the phone every time, he'll respond to every email. And if he doesn't know the answer, he's gonna get it to you. He has been a, a real force in the small business community during this crisis. So from the bottom of my heart, Jock, can't say enough about what you've done for everyone and can't say enough about what you've done for DeKalb County Unites. So with that, I'll shut up and I'm gonna turn it over to Jock to kind of kick things off. Wow, I, I, I don't even know what to say after that, but the good news is that two of the people on there are really my eventual bosses, so thanks for that, Colin. The people from the DCO are, you know, are those people. Jeff, did you wanna start it off today with something or? Sure, yeah, so I, I had an early question and I, I first I wanna say thank you to DeKalb Unites for putting this together. I've heard some great feedback from business owners in the 70th district and throughout DeKalb County about what a valuable resource this has been as they're trying to navigate this new normal. So hat, hats off to your, your organization. Uh, please do continue to use our office as you have already as a resource to help identify and target information. We are happy to do that. That is why we are here. Uh, please, please shoot us an email. Our, our information's available online. Uh, we've been spending a lot of time doing that. I first wanted to do a real quick high level overview on the state budget, just because that's been a, a frequent question that I've had from a number of business owners and a number of units of local government. We, we really don't know what that's gonna look like yet at this point. We anticipate being back in session sometime in late May or June, uh, but right now the governor under his 30 days of emergency power is kind of making some, some rules and regulations and the legislature is is developing laws, uh, developing legislation and ideas in a budget, um, kind of in context with what COVID has done to impact our state. We don't quite know what that's gonna look like yet, just like your local business doesn't quite know what that's gonna look like yet. So don't be afraid to ask the questions. Um, I think the more questions, the more things that we have out there right now, the better, better able we are. So uh, just to give a quick commercial on us moving towards that. 
Um, I'm so heartened today to have Margaret, Brad, and Jonathan with us. They are truly the experts that are going to help business owners navigate through this. They are amazing resources for business owners, and I'm so glad that we've, we're going to have some exposure to what they offer us here today. Uh, I did have a question at the beginning from Ed Kuhn. Ed, thank you. You asked, fair maps are a crucial need. What are the chances of getting it on the ballot for November? Um, Ed, as you may or may not know, this is something that has been near and dear to my heart and something I have fought aggressively for. There's Jeff, can you explain that to people that don't know what fair maps is? Sure, sure. Right. So right now, um, if anybody's familiar with the term gerrymandering, um, in the state of Illinois, we have a, uh, a little bit of a history with gerrymandering some districts. Um, and what happens as a result of that is we have the legislators drawing the map, picking who the voters are that will elect the next legislator. My feeling is the voters should decide who their elector is, and we should be more similar to what they have in Iowa, where they set up a map based on geographic boundaries for uh, government units. So they try to keep a whole county together. They try to keep a whole city together. So it's not split down the middle into to, uh, smaller and smaller parts that have less and less influence. Um, yeah. There have been a number. Go ahead, Don. Oh, uh, no, finish, finish. There have been a number of efforts over the past number of years. I think the last effort, we had 563,000 Illinoisans sign a petition asking for fair maps to be on the ballot. And that's what we've been seeking. It's a bipartisan request. You see it throughout the, the uh, not only the state of Illinois, but the country, where it has unduly impacted the ability of certain areas to have the, their voice heard in their legislative body. So, um, Jeff, circling back. Pardon my frankness on this, but yeah. Um, can we talk about the economics and today, for example, I just saw today for the first time that the treasurer of the state of Illinois has a program that banks um, have available to them, but I haven't seen anything from the borrowers end about how to apply for this. Not what Axion is doing, um, but I, I just saw this. Do you, do you know anything about it? I haven't yet, but I'll defer to my peers. Ed, we can answer the rest of that question offline. Hey, real quick, Jock. Uh, we had a slew of people come in after we got started, and I just wanted to make it clear. If anyone has a question, move the mouse down to the bottom of your screen, and you're going to see the Q&A button. Please type in your question there. I saw Diane, you're raising your hand. Um, just type in your question right there, and we'll make sure that we get it to Jock so we can get it answered. Go ahead, Jock. And Jeff, I didn't mean to cut you off, but, you know, there's just – November, <laughs> let's hope we survive until November, I guess is what it's going to be. Just Jonathan, trying to answer Margaret, the question. Do you know anything about the, the treasurers, the, the state treasurer? Um, I think it was like 250 million going to banks in distressed areas. I am unfamiliar with this yet. I'd be happy to look at the resource if you want to share it. Margaret or Jonathan, are you having awareness on that? So, so yeah, so this program was rolled out a little while ago and it's actually something that I've been working on quite closely just to figure out ways that we can get this money out to communities. So um, one thing that I do want to flag for you all, if you have community development corporations in your region, in your district, they are actually an exception to that. And so the treasurer actually said that they will work with the CDCs, but the banks will have to apply and then they'll take the recommendations from the CDC. And so if those banks are willing to take the money that they get from the treasurer's office and actually um, provide that to a CDC, then they can actually issue those loans, right? If they had that structure set up. So it is something that is a resource. I feel like it's being underutilized right now. And so um, it is something that I've been paying attention to. So I hope that's helpful. Uh, but I do agree with you that we need to make sure that we're getting that resource out there. So Jonathan, um... I, I looked at the list of lenders that had available. There was no one in DeKalb, no one in Sycamore. Uh, I think the closest was Rochelle and it was Hocum Bank. So how do we as small businesses apply for that? So bank, the banks have to actually apply. And so I think the tough part is if someone's not on that list, encouraging the financial institutions to actually apply for the program. So okay. um, I think encouraging lenders in your region to reach out to the treasurer's office would be a good first step. And then, um, like I said before, if you know of any community development corporations, I know they have banks within their offices that um, may be people who are eligible for that program as well. So I would just encourage them, the banks and the financial institutions to reach out to the treasurer to become a part of that. And if they're eligible, then they can then make those resources available to you. Okay, so let's pretend that we're Holcomb Bank and Rochelle, because I know that they're one of them. How do I, as a small business then, apply specifically for that kind of loan? 
Well, so so the bank you're saying that bank has already applied to the treasurer's program, or they have? Correct. They're listed as one of the banks. Okay. So then you would reach out to the bank, and then the bank is getting kind of their guidance from the treasurer's office around what makes sense, and so you would actually work through the bank. And I tell them that this is the program that I want. This is the program that you 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 want to um, apply for and be eligible for, and so really it's the bank getting the money from the treasurer's office, like you would work directly with financial, financial institutions. Josh, you don't think that. we've got Kimberly asking, can someone provide a little background information on this program? Because I think some of us are, are not understanding exactly what program you're referring to. So I can actually send around a, kind of a breakdown in, on the treasurer's website on, on the program, just so people have it, because I'm sure there's going to there's gonna be a lot of questions from this one. There's also the application for small businesses to be able to apply to their lender, but they have the application on the site. So just if you're a small business, you kind of want to see what you would get involved with, or you kind of that road you'd go down, um, you'll be able to have a sneak peek of that before you start looking for the lenders. Um, Courtney, would you like me to share that with you? Or if I put it in the Q&A box, will everyone be able to see that? How about both? Share it with Courtney, and then we'll send it out to all the people on this webinar. But if you could put it in the Q&A box, we'll make that answered so everyone can see that as well. Wonderful. Jonathan, how long has this been around? It, it kind of rolled out right when all of the programs came out. And okay. so I feel like at the time, it was a bunch of folks kind of looking at what made sense between EIDL and then our programs at DCEO. And so it probably got looked over just because we were all kind of looking for resources at that time. And so, okay. um, you know, as Team Red, we've actually been working with some banks and regions to try and take advantage of this. So it's been around just as, as long as the other programs have as well. So let me put a, a plug in for Brad, because you know, Brad does this kind of lending every single day. Brad, any word? Uh, is, the, is the state money gonna dry up pretty soon? Dry up? No, uh, but mm -hmm. is it uh, very, very popular? Yes. So I wanna be as clear as I can be about that. And I'm thankful to the partnership with Margaret, Jonathan, all of DCEO, the whole of the state in trying to stand up essentially overnight uh, an emergency loan program that gets capital in the hands of small businesses throughout the state as fast as possible in a uniform way that has clear criteria that everybody can follow. So and Brad, what's that. this called for the people that don't know? Yeah, so the Illinois State Business Emergency Loan Program, the application for which you can access on the DCEO site, uh, Margaret and Jonathan, feel free to sort of explain that uh, sort of the location of the webpage as you wish clearly, but, um, but just know that we are actively taking applications, we are processing them quickly uh, and trying to get funding out as fast as possible on a daily basis. Okay, so do you see, and why don't you just tell us a little bit more about Axion, about what they do besides just this, because you have other programs that aren't quote sanctioned by the state, correct? Well, we're friends with the state, so everything we do is <laughs> sanctioned by the state, but yes, I understand what you're saying. Uh, so, Axion serving Indiana and Illinois, uh, that's the organization. Um, we are a mission-driven nonprofit that helps neighborhood entrepreneurs grow. We do that by providing all three of the capital and the coaching and the connections that small business owners need in order to create the jobs and wealth in their communities that we want them to. So, we serve all of Illinois and Indiana, but we have a very specific focus on those communities that typically are a little bit less well served by traditional financial institutions, entrepreneurs of color, women entrepreneurs, individuals who would typically get um, a little bit more, um, a little bit harder access than, than normal. And so that's what we do generally. I think in this particular case, we're partnering with the state in order to do something that's a little different uh, than what we typically would do. And in this case, it's less about trying to idiosyncratically find the right way to get something in the hands of most small business owners and do that in the slow, methodical way that we need to in order to treat each business owner as the unique individual and the unique business that they are. We will go back to that. But at the moment, it's cash and speed. And so at the moment, we have a singular way through partnership with the state to evaluate each application that comes in and then as quickly as possible, get them to the yes bucket and then get the funding out to them so that then those businesses can use that capital in the way that they desperately need. And Brad, the criterion I saw, uh, besides size and revenue, 500 minimum credit score, is that correct? Yeah, I'll highlight a few things. Margaret, please, uh, Jonathan, jump in if I've missed anything. But the basics are, first, that you have been in business for a year at the time at which you receive your, uh, your funding. 
Second, that you have a minimum credit score of 500 as a small business owner. Third, that you are a business that in 2019, in normal times, had revenues of less than $3 million and had employees less than 50. Again, focusing on those small Main Street businesses that are typically those that are harder for us collectively to reach in order to make the funding that we have stretch as far as possible. And then we'll talk in a minute about how we then size the loan. But as the basic criteria goes, that's it. Okay. So turnaround time typically has been, if you know. Yeah, so this is the hard part. Nobody needs for me to tell them that turning this around is not nearly as fast as any small business owner would like. That's just a fact. The amount of demand that we have is far in excess of the supply of the capital that we have or the people that we have to process in the way that we normally would. Okay, so stipulated. That's true for every single program that's been launched in the midst of the emergency given the crisis that we're facing. However, I will say that our objective is that once we reach your application in the queue, that we then find that day everything that we need to ask you for that you didn't put into the original application. This is the required business bank statements that we need in order to size your application. Uh, whatever else we might be lacking in what you originally provided for us. And that then once we're working with you, we will turn that around as fast as you can give us that documentation so we can move you to closing and to funding as quickly as possible. So once you get to that point, you're looking at a two to three day window in order for us to finish the application provided you can respond. And then after that, it's another subsequent two to three days for us to initiate the funding and get that funding out the door. Now, all of that is again with two huge caveats, just to set everybody's expectations well here. One is that the queue is very, very, very long. And so we're working very hard to get through it as fast as we can, but it's gonna take us some time, no question about that. And two, we're seeking to provide as many of these loans as we can, but all of that is subject to the amount of money that we can bring into the program. So we have targets uh, that the governor has established, but we hope to exceed those targets if we can, and that's all subject to us raising the capital to then turn around and lend over the course of time. So just know that we're gonna to continue to work on this until we get through as many applications as we possibly can as quickly as we can. So then Jeff, it begs the question, is Springfield coming up with more dough for these kinds of programs? And you're muted. So at this point, there's a working group that's trying to address what that economic incentive package needs to look like. This program, if I remember correctly, does come out of the treasurer's office, right? So. It no. does not, no. Oh, no. Uh, so just yeah. to clarify that, the state has been incredibly helpful in establishing a loan loss reserve using previously appropriated funds that were available, without which none of this works, because we then need to go find the private bank capital in order to then lend. So to be clear on that, we're borrowing at like 1.5% and lending at 3%. I'll go raise the rest of the money I need to cover all the costs that that spread doesn't cover. But none of that works without the states already sort of all in participation of providing $10 million in loan loss reserves because nobody else is going to kind of come in without that. So the state's been great already on this. So that's not a working group I've been working on, but there's a working group tasked specifically to economically, how do we, how do we be a resource for the Illinois small business owner and big business owner? Um, so those discussions are ongoing. Okay. Real quick, Jack, we got a couple of questions. Yeah, is that right? Right? So uh, right along these lines, uh, one question from Lynette is, the Illinois Emergency Loan App through Axiom asks for a minimum amount needed for the loan. And if I remember right, the, the loan is a maximum of 50,000, it's 3% over five years, um, something like that, okay. So the, the amount for the loan, if applying for the maximum amount of 50,000, how does one determine what the minimum is? So I think the question is, how, how do I know what I can apply for or, or how does that part work? Yeah, so um, this is really important to get right because it's structured differently than the Paycheck Protection Program through the SBA and the federal government. So we can get back to that later, but most importantly for this purpose, um, we are trying to evaluate the size of your business based on what you did in normal times and judging that based on the average monthly revenues from your business bank statements in October and November and December. So functionally, there's really no minimum, really, uh, when you get down to it. Um, now, whether it's worth your while to go through uh, application process and all of the things for a couple hundred bucks, that's up to you, I guess. But really what we're looking for here is to provide businesses with the average monthly revenue 
that they had in normal times and treat that as the loan amount. So that's neither the minimum or the maximum. That's just the amount that you're eligible so, for. So to an average, like Q4, you just mentioned. So October, November, December, if I averaged out my monthly revenue and it was 40,000 a month, let's say, that's yep. what I could apply for. Is that 40? Correct. Okay. That's correct. Another question, and I, I know this answer, but I got to ask it. Is it forgivable in any way like the PPP? Cohen, before you go there with PPP, so yeah. Brad, if I'm a seasonal business and my last quarter isn't as good as my first, second, or third quarter, what happens then? Yeah, great question. So we're trying to be as paper light as possible, which hopefully is refreshing for small businesses relative to their typical experience with financial institutions. Uh, and therefore saying October, November, December, just give us those three business bank statements. We've had a lot of businesses who've asked this, who've asked this exact question. In that case, if you think as a business owner that it's a lot more illustrative of your business to show us 12 business bank statements for the whole of the year, fine, send us those. Um, or if it's six or whatever, that's fine too. We don't want to ask for 12 or we don't need 12, but if you want to give us 12 to give us a better picture, do it. That's great. I'm sorry, so, Cohen, go ahead. The last question was, uh, is this forgivable in any way like the PPP program? It is not. And so that's a really important point where this is a straight term loan as simple as we can make it where you don't pay anything for six months and then the loan fully amortizes 3% interest in principal months seven through 60. Um, I will say that if you're able to secure a PPP, you should do it as a small business owner because grants are great, right? That's why the state had a $14 million grant program for hospitality businesses. Like grants are better than loans, period. Um, the problem, of course, as we all know, is that accessing a financial institution who can give you an application and take your application to get that through that right. process is really hard. The money's run out. Yes, it will be replenished. But at the moment, uh, we're trying to provide that additional capital beyond the PPP, which is not as good because, I mean, the federal government can give you free money. That's great. Take it. Um, but this is incredibly attractive capital relative to normal times that the state is providing through this program. And therefore, uh, that's the way we structured it in this case. Yeah. And since you mentioned it, just all of our listeners, every Monday at two o'clock, we have Mark Kerman from Seifert, an accountant, and Frank Robertson, the First National Bank uh, banker, and we discuss simply the PPP program, and in the past, it was the EIDL program. Um, so we're covering that every Monday, so this Monday, stay tuned, and you can find out additional information about the federal package, which is the PPP and EIDL program. Today, we're talking about the state of Illinois and the programs available to us. So uh, for, the, for the people from the state, Jeff, you included, of course, uh, you talk about hospitality. Is there going to be another round of hospitality help coming from the state? Since that deadline was kind of short for those people. I know there were some grants that were just revealed this week, but Margaret, I think you'd be better able to answer that. Yeah, I mean, so it's definitely something we're exploring and having conversations about. I mean, the program itself, um, Brad can testify to this because ASEAN was also involved in the hospitality grant. Um, we had over 12,000 applications and we're only able to distribute about 700 plus grants. Um, so it is, a, it is a conversation that's being had because obviously there's a need for a program like that, especially for small businesses that are in the hospitality industry. Um, but at this point, there are uh, we don't have any, uh, you know, concrete plans to, to move forward with the second round. Okay. Is there any other programs that seem to be almost ready to go or it's all discussion? Um, there, there are discussions about different manufacturing programs um, that we're hoping to do uh, that are grants. Um, we're still doing capital grants. IDOT is still doing capital grants as well. Um, so those programs, the programs that we've had um, for businesses um, still exist. Um, also our, you know, incentives and everything like that. Um, but at this moment, any new programs are still in kind of a discussion phase. Okay. And, and I want to dovetail in on that. I, I think kudos to the governor and the federal level at, at really getting some quick aid and opportunity programs deployed right when this started to hit. I mean, I don't, I don't know that there have been many other times where we've had so many great government programs that have just rolled out all of a sudden. And, and I, I enjoy that they were falling forward on, on being just getting it out there. And now we're seeing where those shortfalls are. So a lot of what we're going to be able to do is going to be dependent not only on, on what our budget's going to look like when we talk in June, but also what that federal package is going to look like that they're still crafting a fourth generation for right now in D.C. Yeah. And Jeff, you're right. I mean, 
it's only been 17, 18 days since this whole thing was rolled out. I know the SBA had said that um, the amount of loan applications that they've gotten in four weeks or three weeks um, is 14 years worth of what they had recently. So yeah, that's gotta be kind of tough. Um, and, and there's 14 or 16 different working groups that the legislature has divided up into to address these critical areas. And, and most people are focused on one or two of those in hopes that we come together. So with business owners that are, are unique to a certain field, please funnel those ideas back. We've got a portal on our, our website where if you've got an idea or suggestion or, or a simplification of a law that stands in the way, let us know to make your life easier and hopefully cost you less and get you on the other side of this quicker. Jeff, what's that URL that they should go to? You can go to repkiker.com and there's a link on there or on social media. We just posted it this morning. Okay. It's like a suggestion box. Uh, it, it seems as if some of the local businesses think that some of the big box stores may have an advantage over them about um, <laughs> not being able to being essential or not being open. And Margaret, you said you were going to take this one. So um, yeah, it's a, it's, a really, it? it's very tough. It's very tough. So um, what we're seeing is that a lot of the big box stores, they do sell essential items and essential goods. And it's really hard um, at a state level or even a local municipality to be able to limit a lot of what those big box stores sell. Um, you know, if they, it's, we say, well, we can't limit their sale of widgets if they also sell gadgets and people need gadgets. Um, and unfortunately, you have a small business community that they may only sell widgets and we are able to, they're, they're a non-essential business. Um, so that's where it's coming into the, the big box store dilemma. Um, we are trying to do the best we can with, um, you know, at least getting this information out to business owners um, on whether or not they are essential or non-essential. And we have had over 1,400, uh, you know, inquiries uh, at DCO alone about questions like that that we've gotten back to. So I do encourage if you do have a question about your business specifically being essential or non-essential to email ceo.support at illinois.gov and I'll send that over to Courtney as well um, and we'll, we'll be able to answer any questions you have uh, re with regards to essential versus non-essential businesses. All right, so Margaret, you know, I, I was a small business owner and my mind kind of thinks that way and I bet you Cohen was thinking the same thing when you said that. So if I happen to be able to get my hands on some essential merchandise um, and I can sell that in my place of business, does that mean they could buy other items while they're there? Kind of like the big box store. So I, I would have to say that's probably a case by case basis that we'll have to evaluate. Um, that's not really the spirit of the executive order, obviously. I mean, we're doing this to save lives. Um, so when we're talking about the nature of a business, we'll probably be looking at the nature of the business and not necessarily, you know, uh, what products they could procure um, if they are allowed to continue to be open, looking at more of what the, the history of that business has been. But again, it is very much a case by case basis. It's why one of the reasons we do try to work with the local municipality when we're issuing these, because unfortunately DCO doesn't, you know, have the manpower to go out and evaluate every single business. Um, so we're trying to at least defer and work with the local municipality on the essential versus non-essential question. Okay. Cohen, any questions there? Uh, no, but I wanted to clarify with everyone, if you have a question, go down to the bottom, click on Q&A and type in your question there. Kimberly, I know you keep raising your hand, um, but just go ahead and type it in in the Q&A and we'll get that question answered. Um, but right now, I think we're just all engrossed listening to the conversation, Jack. So if, if and anyone could take this, and I hope you all do take this. So I don't want to say, when do you see us coming out of this? And I don't want to ask, how is it going to be different? But what I would like to know is what do you, what's the best piece of advice that you could give these small business owners today that are really struggling, waiting for dollars and, um, you know, maybe not having workforce and, and, and those types of things. What's, what's the best piece of advice you could give them besides pray, I would think. The, the first thing I would say is I hope like most business owners, I have a, a 
a group of advisors that I trust from a lawyer to an accountant to other business owners that are in town. And, and don't be shy about talking about your struggles. I think that's one of the strengths here behind DeKalb County Unites is you're allowing these business owners to, to uh, not only understand and develop, but, but develop some bonds about some of the common struggles that are being seen and, and in seeking those common solutions. So I think that collaborative nature is very important so that you're not isolated. Second is ask those folks for advice. Ask the bankers for advice, ask Jock for advice. Reach out to Cohen, reach out to the chamber and say, this is what I'm facing, what can I do? Um, I have found that a lot of the things that, that folks are encountering that are trouble spots, um, they fall into one category. Either I'm operating on assumptions or I have good solid information. I'm working forward in an educated way about what that best path might look like. There is no question that we're facing adversity right now. And, and all of those wise decisions are gonna come through multiple conversations on what that path looks like for your business. And don't hesitate to have those conversations. You know, Jeff, it's interesting, some of the phraseology that you use, because we know in the beginning there was a lot of misinformation. Mm -hmm. And even though we've been at this a couple of weeks now, we still hear some of that misinformation being passed about. So you're absolutely right. We need to deal with what it actually is, not what we think it's going to be. All right, Jonathan, do you have any comment on what we so can do? I, I, would, I would just say that I think, you know, when this first started, folks were kind of like prioritizing certain loans or which grants or what should I apply for. I would say that, you know, take action um, while things are open right now, um, because I think that funds are being exhausted fairly quickly. Um, while everyone's working as hard as we can to get more funds, I think, you know, we want to make sure that we can get dollars out the door and we can get applications in, because I think the tough part is, is when we see like what happened yesterday, today EIDL and PPP, PPP closing it kind of creates that that frustration and that kind of feeling of you know what do we do now and so I also just want to take the time to reinforce the fact that as Margaret said our capital funds are open our rebuild grants are open that includes our regional economic development grants our public infrastructure grants um, and and we really are and our opportunity zone grants that are still open and I know these aren't necessarily directly aligned with COVID but I think that there are ways for us to still do good um, in a tough time, and I don't want us to, to miss opportunities, you know, here as well. Um, and so I just want to make sure that, you know, we are, are doing our best. I have a regional economic development team that's committed to working with businesses um, in your region. And so um, anything you need, you can reach out directly to me or my team. But we are committed at DCEO to doing our best to continue to retain our businesses, grow our businesses, and attract new businesses, as well as get folks back to work. I will also say um, our workforce development team is working on putting out grants to help upskill workers. I do want to make sure that we are doing the best we can to make sure displaced workers are getting um, opportunities to get jobs. And, and, and so, you know, that's kind of what we've been focused on at DCEO. And so I don't want to miss that because I think it's important that we do that as well. So um, whatever we can do to continue to alleviate some of this, we will, but I do want to make sure we're paying attention to that. So Jonathan, you know, thank you for that. How soon, or I mean, how will some of these businesses qualify for those different uh, programs that you just mentioned? And if so, how quickly will they get dollars into the bank? Two of our programs are rolling. So, you know, while we are at capacity right now, we do encourage folks to apply as soon as possible so that if you're eligible for those and we start to make those grant decisions, then those dollars can come out. So specifically, Shovel Ready, um, as well as, you know, our economic development grants, um, they are rolling. And so I want to make sure that, you know, I emphasize that. And so I do know our community development team is going to start looking at some of that in July. And so we want to make sure um, that we're getting those applications in now so that when they do start to make those assessments, those decisions can get to the people who had their applications in. So um, I think, you know, that's the biggest thing about our rolling grants is that, you know, the sooner you kind of get to them, um, the, the sooner decisions can be made. Okay, thank you. Mackenzie did a survey and they asked small businesses, um, how long could you last before you have to go out of business? And uh, 30 percent of them said about 30 days. So we're really pushing up against that right now. That's, that's why I asked if they were something quick. Margaret, your suggestions or words of wisdom? I very much echo Jonathan's uh, points that he made. 
Um, we know it's very difficult. Um, we are trying at DCEO to be a resource as much as we can. I mean, um, I, I provide my information as much as I possibly can to all small business owners just so that we can help at least navigate. Um, we have a first stop business portal, um, both via email and also a hotline. Again, I'll share that with Courtney. If you have a question, we try to get back to you within 24 hours um, with an answer to your question. Um, so we are trying to at least help people navigate the programs that do exist right now. Um, and then also to John point maybe direct you to some of the programs that we have standing within the department so you can access those resources okay and Brad the capitalist of the group what kind of advice do you have I'm usually referred to as the nonprofit guy from the group. <laughs> Not in thing. this group <laughs> this is fun um, two things I think one is pretty consistent with the best practice that I'd say in normal times and one is very much not so I think first I highly recommend that not only should you communicate with like your smart people who work with you, Jeff's quite right about that. Uh, I'd take it even a step further and be very upfront in communicating with all of those folks for whom you have some contractual relationship where you owe them money. And so I've had lots of people ask us things like, Hey, should I just stonewall my landlord? Like he must be dealing with all this stuff. Like he knows the deal. He didn't need to like hear from me. I just won't pay him. I don't recommend that. Uh, I think instead, um, speak with everybody who you owe something to and work something out. Everybody understands, like, this is not normal. And so I think that's the basis for building longstanding trusting relationships over the course of time that are down to the benefit of your business. And that's true for your lender, for your utility, for your landlord, whatever it might be. The other thing I'd say is that um, I'll pick up on what Jonathan suggested. Um, I would never in normal times suggest a small business owner, you should just spray around loan applications and just like apply to everybody and whoever comes in funding first, take that. Like that's bad practice, but it's not bad practice right now. And the reason is of course, that in an environment of scarce resources, an environment of very, very long queues for every single one of these emergency programs, if you're eligible for something, apply for it. And yes, there's a downside to that because your credit's gonna get pulled more than once perhaps. But look, I mean, Cash is king here and time is of the essence. So apply multiple times and in this particular circumstance, that's okay. So has anyone in this group heard about um, credit card companies? Are they turning things around quickly? Not that you were suggesting that, Brad, but that thought just came into my head. Yeah, no, I was not suggesting that. Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, my heavy, heavy, heavy suspicion without having the data to back this up is that the normal uh, solicitations for credit card companies will go unanswered in an environment like this compared to what you would typically expect where they'll bite your hand off if they can find out that you'll pay attention to them. That is not going to happen in this case. Right. That makes sense. You know, we actually, some of the things that you all talked about, uh, we in Unites uh, actually talked about early on. And uh, that was about the relationship that you have with your vendors, with your customers, with your employees. and Cohen was a big proponent of doing that with his bank, uh, with talking with his customers. He, he kind of led the charge with that. And with that, since you gave me all those uh, kudos, Cohen, I tried to turn it around on you. Anything, any other questions out there right now? There is. Uh, uh, Phil is asking, is there any movement on legislation to require insurance companies to pay out claims for business interruption due to COVID-19? And I've heard that a lot. Uh, is this force majeure, right? Um, so, so I'm just curious for what's out there because it seems like a lot of insurance companies are just saying, ah, no, not covered. Um, and didn't know if there was any insight from this group on that. So with, with all due disclosure, I'm in the insurance business as a regular field. You muted yourself. Oh, got you. All right. We had, we have a tendency to deal with more of the personal line products and, and have a little bit of exposure to the business lines. Uh, but these mass casualty type situations where there's there's losses like this uh, is something akin to what we saw after 9-11, that that terrorism risk coverage was set up at the federal level because it's just not something that actuarially can be uh, derived or charged for. And, and if the insurance company was to build into their contract something that would provide coverage for something this broad, it, it wouldn't be able to be afforded uh, in a day-to-day contract for a commercial entity. So um, that's standard. Now, what I do understand from reading some anecdotal 
uh, newspaper accounts is that some of the insurance contracts maybe didn't have the specificity that others did. So there are a few lawsuits that have been filed on this. So I would tell you as an insurance professional, this is on a case by case basis. First talk to your agent, then read for yourself the business interruption language within your contract. Um, and if need be, go, uh, go speak to an attorney about it. You know, and I actually uh, saw something just this morning that talked about talking to your agent and or your broker uh, only because some of the insurance companies are deferring payment or reducing payment for premiums, whether this was commercially or it was for benefits, which I thought was really pretty good. But all of it was talk to the company, the broker or the agent to really find out what they can do for you. Yeah, as my peer Kimberly is pointing out there in the dialogue, it is a, a contract between you and insurance company is an individual contract between the two of you, whether you're business or personal. And uh, those provisions do change company to company. So your agent who made that promise to you is the, the great first line of defense on getting an answer. Okay, good. Hey, Jock, um, we have a, a slew of questions regarding PPP and EIDL, and I'll ask the anonymous attendee who keeps asking a lot of those, please tune in Monday, um, and we can cover a, a whole bunch of those. But one of them is, uh, hey, help, uh, who do I ask for help? I'm confused, there's so many options, all that. If you go to decalcountyunites.com, you're gonna see uh, some of us have set up office hours um, where we'll actually schedule a time with you and, and just go over it. Uh, my phone number is 815-991-2402. Call me. If I don't pick up, just leave me a message. I'll call you back. I'll share everything I can with you. Um, and if I can't find the answer, I'll get, it to, get you to the person who can. But we also have, have Jock Easy. And Jock, is it email that's best for them to reach out to you as well? Either that or, or phone, uh, email, sbdcjms at gmail. My phone number, uh, again, that's, it's, on the, it's on the site, SBDC, Small Business Development Center, JMS, my initials, at gmail.com. And then my phone number is 267-275-6950, 267-275-6950. Um, I do encourage you, as I did from the very first day, continue to apply for these things. I firmly believe more dollars are coming and we're going to be able to, they'll, they'll, they'll still continue to process. Banks may be holding uh, the PPL or the PPP uh, applications, but once the SBA opens it up again with funding, they're going to shoot those through. So continue to do those things. Absolutely. And we also have three team members in the Northeast region. So again, if for whatever reason folks are inundated, the regional economic development team at DCEO is available to assist you with technical assistance as well. And our first stop, you know, portal and, and all of that. So I just want to keep, you know, that front line. And my information is jonathan.mcgee at illinois.gov. I'm happy to, to coordinate any type of, um, you know, communications on my team, but I just want to make sure that um, you all are aware of that as well. Jonathan, do you think you could um, send to Courtney maybe a, a brief um, what the program is, who might qualify, you know, just like was done with the, with the SBA and with the state of Illinois with the different programs, you know, just a quick and dirty cheat sheet so that people can look at that pretty quickly and say, yeah, yeah I one pages. I'm happy to do so. And our website, we have a lot of that as well on our website. We have three yeah. bubbles, how to help businesses, how to help workers, but I'm happy to follow up with that also. Great. Thank you. And Jock, same thing. Um, on the Axion Emergency Capital website, we update that every single day with the latest information about, uh, for us, it's City of Chicago, State of Illinois, Federal, all of that. And we do a side by side by side of how to evaluate eligibility criteria amounts and all of that across the different programs. So I'll provide to Courtney the web link for that uh, so that then that can be posted in whatever way you would like. And again, that's a daily update that we make. Great. And, and Brad, if I could ask real quick, because I do get a number of questions from business owners. What's the common or most common misstep that most business owners are making, whether they're supplying documentation or a misunderstanding? What are those common frustration points that you're uncovering? It's a great question. Uh, the honest truth is the common frustration point is how come it's taking us long to get to me in the queue? 
Okay. Um, so everything else is far, 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 far less than that. Um, but once we get to an applicant, the, I think the predominant challenge on the state emergency side is making sure that we can substantiate the income. And so if somebody says, well, I kind of commingled my personal and bank account information, so my bank balance, it's not really right, or I'm a seasonal business, so I want to show you 12 months, but then we look at the 12 months and they aren't really all that different, so we got to untangle that. It's, it's the substantiation of the revenue, which is the way that we size the loans that kind of takes the most time in that. The PPP side is very different. The problem is the same. The documentation is different because in that case, you need to substantiate your payroll, not your revenue. And therefore, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can substantiate payroll, but you got to pick whatever documents you got available. So it depends on the program in that way. Hey, Brad, a uh, quick question. Uh, unlike the PPP, but, uh, or maybe it is like it. Is there a personal guarantee associated with the uh, Illinois Small Business Emergency Loan Fund? There is. So we do not take collateral, uh, but there is a personal guarantee that's associated with the state fund. We do a UCC lien, uh, which we would typically do for any loan, mm -hmm. um, but no security, no collateral in that way. Okay. What about any penalty for prepayment? So let's say I receive the money and also my business bounce back. Can I just give the money back and have no penalties? There's no fees to apply, no fee to prepay, no fees at all. The only just, cost at all is just the interest that you would incur. Yeah, that 3% over the time that I actually had the money in my bank account. Correct. Okay. Yeah. All right. And Brad, I'm a little confused. You mentioned PPP. Is Axion doing PPP also taking application? No, um, okay. but we get hundreds of questions a day. <laughs> Okay. So you got yeah. good at answering those, even though we don't offer them. Yeah. All right, because I was a little confused just then. Same here. <laughs> We're doing both the City of Chicago program and the State of Illinois program, uh, and spending most of our time, frankly, on the State of Illinois program, which is relevant here. Uh, but you can just imagine the we get something like 700 questions a day uh, on average from borrowers just looking for help, and so we're trying to answer all of them, regardless of what the subject matter is. Right. Okay. Any other questions, uh, Colin? No, I, I no, not 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 overall that we would address on this, but there's a couple that I'll definitely uh, filter on that Jeff. Uh, I, uh, after I do I do want to ask Brad one more question if I can, Brad. You know, we we see what's going on in DeKalb County. Do you see any other neat um, community-based solutions that you're seeing in other areas that you're working in? Some some innovative ways to overcome challenges. It's a great question. Um, yeah, honestly, what we're doing at the moment is sort of uh, the inverse of what you just suggested because I, think, I forget who it was, Jock maybe pointed out that the state moves so fast relative to other jurisdictions that I'm getting questions and being pulled onto calls all the time to help other municipalities, other states figure out how to do what Illinois stood up really quickly. And that's both for the grants for hospitality in particular, and then also for the loans for everybody. Um, and so the one thing I will say, though, is that as we're thinking about just as creatively as possible to think, how can we get as much capital from where it sits to where it's needed as creatively and as fast as we can? I have had conversations with a handful of economic development folks and local financial institutions that just have small balance sheets to say, well, what if we follow all the rules for the state, but just specifically give you just a little bit of money just to help our people? <laughs> so... We're trying to be ecumenical in this and help everybody as fast as possible throughout the state and not do that. Um, but I will say that once we complete what we can do statewide, we therefore at that moment will have more bandwidth and we will happily come back to think now what more can we do to help support the recovery in specific places after the immediate rescue. Uh, but I think for the immediate rescue, we're trying to treat everybody equally outside of the city of Chicago for the whole of downstate and uh, the collar counties and all of that. Um, and be as fast as possible, as consistent as possible, and then be open to other suggestions that follow after that. All right. Any parting words? Good going. It's all you. Wonderful. All right. Uh, to all the small business owners that are attending out there, uh, man, it sucks right now, and we get it, right? DeKalb County Unites, we're just trying to answer as many questions as possible. I'm a small business owner, I feel you. You go to the state websites, you go to the federal websites, you try and get information, you pick up the phone, no one's calling because they're overwhelmed with applications. It's a really tough time right now. 
we all just need the you know nose of the grindstone. I mean, we're small business owners. We're used to the grind. We're used to the hustle. Now more than ever, we need to have the grind. We need to have the hustle in order to get through this. But DeKalbCountyUnites.com is there to, to help you as much as possible. So if you've got questions, go to our site, see if we answered. If we didn't answer it, fill out the contact us form. Well, we will do our best to try and answer it. We're all a bunch of volunteers here. We all have our own COVID-19 crisis going on that we're all dealing with, but we are committed to getting you the information that you need to hopefully remove some of the anxiety and hopefully generate a positive economic impact on your small business within DeKalb County and even the larger area. So I just wanna say thank you to all of you that came on today. Thank you to uh, Jeff Kiker, uh, our state representative from the 70th district. Awesome, Jeff, you've always been uh, a great resource to us uh, in DeKalb County. I wanted to thank Margaret Croak and Jennifer, or Jonathan McGee from the Illinois Department of Commerce and Economic Opportunity. And of course the Axion CEO, uh, Brad McConnell for coming on board. Remind everyone this is recorded. We'll probably have it on social media and on our YouTube channel, which you can all find from our website, DeKalbCountyUnites.com, probably within the hour or two hours, so you can review this again. Um, so I highly encourage you to do that. And a reminder, next week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 2 p.m., we've got a whole other set of webinar series, including this coming Monday, uh, we'll have the discussion, the continued discussion on the PPP program. Those small business owners out there that applied for the PPP, if your bank told you that they have an SBA number, you have a high level of confidence at this point that you will get funded. I personally know people that have been actual funded money in bank after they heard that, including myself. So the money is there. I know we're all cynical right now. We're all just waiting uh, for that to happen. But if your bank told you you had an SBA approved number, chances are that money's coming. It's going to come quickly. Those of you that don't have anything like that, We'll be discussing that hopefully more on Monday to find out a little bit more information about what the next phase of the PPP program looks like. But again, to all of our panelists today, thank you for taking the time to come on. Greatly appreciate it. You all know the stress that's out there and the anxieties out there, and hopefully you guys just help reduce it a little bit by getting the information out there. Um, so that's all I got. Go to DeKalbCountyUnites.com, check us out. We're here to help. So thanks again, everyone, and have a wonderful week. Thank, thank you, everyone. You.